This week, one of our guests, Marlene G. Fine, talks about why she and her partner, Fern Johnson, wrote Let's Talk Race, a guide for white people. We were hopeful that the ways in which we had come to understand issues of race because of our experience as the white parents of black children, that we had something to offer to white people that might help them get past their own concerns, fears, reluctance about talking about. Welcome to Writer's Voices with Monica and Caroline. I'm your host today, Monica Hadley, and we have a really topical book to discuss today. Let's Talk Race, A Guide for White People by Fern L. Johnson and Marlene G. Fine. Fern L. Johnson, Ph.D., is Senior Research Scholar and Professor Emerita at Clark University, specializing in race, culture, and language. She has published a number of books and journal articles and co-authored with Marlene Fine, The Interracial Adoption Option, which draws on their experience as white parents of African-American sons. Together, they adopted two boys. Marlene G. Fine, Ph.D., is Professor Emerita at Simmons University, specializing in cultural diversity, leadership, and dialogue. She authored Building Successful Multicultural Organizations, and her articles appear in a broad range of journals as well. They both live near Boston, Massachusetts. Welcome to Writer's Voices, Fern and Marlene. First of all, thank you for inviting us to the podcast. This is wonderful to be able to talk about our book. Yeah, oh. we're very pleased to be with you. <laughs> well, welcome, welcome. Let's just start right off the top. What led you to adopt Black Sons? Ah, well, um, it is uh, a, a journey. So I'll, I'll start the journey and have some uh, pick up on it. Uh, when we decided to adopt, it was um, about 1988. And, of course, it wasn't legal for lesbians uh, to adopt at that point in time. And also, in the late 80s, the National Association of Black Social Workers had issued a statement that they believed that the adoption of black children by white parents uh, was a form of cultural genocide because they did not believe uh, that white people could properly um, instill a very healthy sense of racial identity in black children, and they feared that whites could not prepare black children for living in a white world. So as academics, we felt very strongly that we would respect the position of the black social workers, uh, and that meant that if we were going to adopt domestically, we would have to try to adopt a white child uh, separately, and um, as a single women trying to adopt, we knew that um, after some phone calls, that was going to take us 10 years or more. And given our ages, we were not willing uh, to wait uh, no, 10, we were 10 years. We were going to be a little hard Yeah. Wow. Uh, uh, we would age out of the system. Uh, so we began to look around at international adoption options, and um, those were limited also. Uh, in some instances, you had to be Catholic. Um, neither of us is Catholic. In some instances, you had to be married, and of course, we weren't married. Uh, in other instances, you had to be Lutheran. Uh, so, you know, we came across one roadblock after another, uh, and finally decided that perhaps we would look at Peru, uh, where we would have to, one of us would have to go live uh, for four months or more in order to be eligible to adopt a child. So at that point, we had begun the process. And um, I'm going to let Fern take over. Uh, we we had begun the process with our adoption agency doing it as each of us a single woman adopting, but the agency knowing that we were a lesbian couple. Um, and so we uh, were each pursuing the adoption and doing uh, individual counseling sessions. So, so, Fern. So this was a very complicated process, as you can probably gather already. Yeah, that sounds like a lot of challenges. Yeah, so, you know, it was a lot of challenges. We, we were going through this process. For all adoptions, you have to do a home study. So I was going to my sessions for home studies, and uh, a social worker was presenting different information about options that you had, different programs they had, how you could enter them, all the requirements, and that sort of thing. 
And then she started to talk about a de- a domestic adoption as it related to foster care. And she said, I want to make very clear, you know, what the relationship is with foster care and adoption, you know, what kinds of children, what ages are available. And then she started to talk about race. And I remember this so distinctly because at the time in the foster care system, there were eight times as many black children as white children. And of the black children, there were eight times as many boys as girls. And the probability of these children being adopted was very low. So it was just mind-boggling to me. So, I, you know, I decided, well, we better reconsider this and talk about it. If we're willing to adopt a child of color from another country, <laughs> why not from the U.S.? And, you know, talk to our, you know, black friends and colleagues and see what they think. So, so that's really the path that got us to the decision. And it wasn't that that black adults were not adopting children. They were in about the same, you know, numbers percentage-wise as whites, but the, but the demand, the number of kids, you know, waiting to be adopted was just overwhelming. Have things changed a little bit in the perspective of, like you said, the black social workers who didn't think that white people should adopt black children. Has that changed over the years? Um, They they no longer make the statement that it's a form of cultural genocide. And um, so, you know, I think that the preference is still always for a black child to be adopted by a black family, Um, but it is not the um, only... um, so, Fern is going to say something about the foster care. Yeah, the, pre- the pressure has really shifted to the foster care system and the requirements, which are so stringent for who can actually adopt. So, there are, are many black people who are approved as foster parents, right. but they can't be approved to adopt a child because they don't have enough bedrooms in their house. You know, it can be all kinds of requirements. They're they're very cumbersome, and so there's been a lot of pressure, um, you know, from many different avenues to really try to make the the system itself, you know, more open to uh, placing children. And and this is also true if you're talking about private adoption agencies. Um, so the requirements also have been very stringent. And in fact, this is not an issue we write about in the book, but as you think about systemic racism, the whole institution of adoption in the United States uh, really has some systemic racism that is simply part of the structure of adoption, just the way you have to be um, uh, vetted in order to be approved to adopt a child. You know, the, the, really, income, the income requirements are very steep. You know, they're, oh, um, wow. really di- they're difficult. Yes. Well, I mean, relative to what the income distribution, in, you know, in the country looks like. Uh, so, you know, th- there are a lot of hurdles. Right. And right. So, you know, it's, it's better, you know, than it used to be, certainly. Um, and, of course, now... You know, international adoption, sadly, you know, is pretty much shut down. We'll see how when that opens. So, I, but that also then creates maybe more flexibility in the in the system in the United States because people who want to adopt have, have you know do not have the you know the, the extensive international you know options that they had you know before COVID. Um, so we'll see. You know, it's always changing. It's always evolving. So was was your interest in, your academic interest in race, did it predate this or was it a result of your ad- adoption? No, it absolutely pre- predated it. Both Marlene and I had already, you know, established careers in teaching and research and uh, you know, facilitating workshops and di- you know dialogues on on racial issues. So it was certainly an issue, you know, broadly, you know, that that we had. But you know, when we as white people 
adopted black children, we learned that there was a whole lot we did not know. And, you know, we thought in writing, you know, this book that we could bring a perspective, you know, that might be helpful for white people in general to, to, to talk about race more productively, you know, more honestly. Um, so, you know, it was really kind of the two things. But, yes, we, we did to answer your question. <laughs> and why, ever, and um, why do you think you had that interest, that great interest as, you know, as white people in race, when many don't, many, like, I mean, you talk about in your book that most white people don't really think about race that much. Well, it's interesting that you asked that question because Fern and I, when we uh, were putting together the website for the book, uh, decided to do a section of the site in which we explored our own uh, coming to understanding issues of race. Um, so we began with our childhood. And, um, you know, it, it led to some deep introspection for both of us and a lot of thinking about it. But, you know, I'll kind of quickly uh, talk about some of the reasons why race became important to me uh, as a young academic. So um, when I grew up, I grew up in a small town in New Jersey, uh, really tiny, a mile by a mile. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, there was a black population and... Um, they primarily, not entirely, but primarily lived in a very small area of town, uh, about one block uh, in each direction, and it was right by my grandparents' house. So I had a fair number of uh, black friends. I went to a school that was integrated. Uh, we only had one class per grade, so it meant that there were, you know, black children in each of my classes. Except that when I was 12, we moved, and we moved to a town uh, that was segregated about seven miles up the road. And that was my first experience with not having any black people around me. I went to a segregated school for a year, and um, I had the experience of my father being invited to a meeting that the men in, in the community were having. Um, and my father didn't attend it, but he told me that the reason for the meeting was to figure out a way to ensure that a black family didn't buy a house that was on the market. Wow. So I was becoming aware of issues of race. And then I went off to an integrated high school um, and never questioned the fact as a high school student that although my school was integrated and there were black students in my homeroom and there were black students in gym with me, there were no black students in my classes, except for one young man who took a couple of English classes during my four years there, but nothing else. Um, and then I had one other um, really dramatic experience as a, as a young person. Uh, we lived in a segregated community, but we lived across the street from a golf and country club that didn't allow either blacks or Jews, and we were Jewish, to belong. Um, and... One day, Althea Gibson, the uh, black tennis player who became a professional golfer, was playing a tournament at the country club, and she was brought in by helicopter. And so she landed on uh, the driving range directly across the street from our house, played the tournament, and then left. And the reason she came in by helicopter is she wasn't allowed to use the facilities. And... It was, for me, as a teenager, this kind of stunning moment of thinking about race. Um, and so I'll just say, at that point, I read a lot. I took some classes as an undergraduate student and just continued my interest. Um, and as a graduate student, I wrote my thesis on the trial of Bobby Seale, um, uh, you know, who was um, part of the original Chicago 8. And um, so that began my interest in, in the study of race in the U.S. Wow. Yeah, so this is fun. Mine's a little different, but if you want to ask Marlene anything about that narrative, we can do that first. Well, do you think that being Jewish and in a community that obviously had some anti-Semitism made you more empathetic? Yes, I, I do think that, although, um, you know, in the book we uh, have a section where we talk about white privilege and my growing up 
and because I experienced um, anti-Semitism uh, when I was young, um, I think it made me more empathetic, but it also blinded me to the notion of white privilege because I really thought that I didn't have privileges, you know, as a, as a young Jewish woman who came from a relatively poor family um, where I was the first to go to college. And so, you know, I, I really didn't understand the notion of privilege until much, much later. Well, we'll get into that a little bit more, but... Um... Would you like to also share your story? A very different story from Marlene's. Um, I grew up in Brooklyn Center, Minnesota, which no one had heard of, heard of until Dante Wright was killed there by police recently. Um, so when I grew up in Brooklyn Center, Minnesota, you know, as you know, a white girl, it was barely a suburb. I mean, there were, there were still truck farms on you know the north side of where we lived. And it was all white. And we only had an elementary school. So everybody in the elementary school was white. Um, I grew up in a Lutheran family. And, you know, diversity meant Catholics and Lutherans. That's kind of what it was. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, because we didn't have a school beyond an elementary school, when it was time to go to seventh grade, uh, the I guess the school district paid money to the city of Minneapolis to bus us into the city. So I went for 7th, 8th, and ninth grade to a school in Minneapolis that was very uh, integrated with blacks and whites, meaning, you know, there were a large number of black students in this school, and there were white students. Um, so we, we were like, you know, imports from, the, from the, this kind of country suburb. And, you know, reflecting back on it, I didn't think about it at the time, um, you know, there was a lot of very much more explicit tracking of students then, I, there still is now, but, you know, the call, if you were going to be, you know, going to college and what have you, you were tracked in a certain way. Well, for 7th, 8th, and ninth grade, there was never one black student in any of my classes, and, you know, I, I didn't think about this at the time. So then comes 10th grade, and they have now built a high school in Brooklyn Center. So, you know, we're back in our suburb, pretty small, you know, a, a graduating class by the time I graduated of about, you know, 120. So a small school, and it was all white. And I didn't think about that either. You know, it was just all white. And, you know, until I went to university, I don't think I ever thought deeply about race. I knew a little bit about it, certainly, because my sister married a Hawaiian man, and that was pretty scandalous <laughs> in my in my family. In fact, he was called the N word. So I did know that <laughs> certainly, and you know this was um, this was kind of the limit of what I knew. Then my brother married. Interestingly, a Korean woman, and so you know, like there was there were some changes happening in the family. But again, you know, I was very unsophisticated about these things. But then, you know, I I was an English major to, to start, and we read a lot of interesting things, and I had some professors who talked about race, and you know, it just gradually developed. And my academic interests tended to go to areas that engaged race so you know it was an it was an educational eye-opening experience for me well it's interesting like two of your um siblings sort of married outside the race so to speak. yeah it is interesting <laughs> it does it just feels like maybe it's something in the way you were raised or something but that that the whole family might be more open-minded and and welcoming to and interested in, in people of other races. I mean, I know people who could say that about themselves, that, you know, it was really their family. That was not my case. Um, you know, I came from a very, you know, con politically conservative family. My father was a very active Republican. He was an accountant. Um, my mother, I think, had 
pretty much publicly followed whatever my father said. That wasn't unusual. I don't. I think she had a broader perspective than he did, but I don't think there was anything in my family. Mm. And you know, maybe maybe it was that the the oldest, my sister, so she was the oldest of the of the three of us. You know, maybe it's because she sort of had a rebellious spirit about her <laughs> any anyway, you know, and she fell in love, you know. And <laughs> I think she was probably as surprised by it as as everybody else was. Well, did your parents ever adjust? <laughs> Were they did they ever yes. good, yes. good. I'm glad yes, to they hear did. that. <laughs> yes, yes, they absolutely they did. Um, and I think, you know, it was my sister and her husband, I mean, they, they went through a fair amount, you know, for a while. Um, but, you know, as people often say, you know, once there's a grandchild and, you know, this and that is happening, things right. start to ease right. up. And they absolutely did. Well, that's, I'm glad. Because <laughs> sometimes it doesn't happen. Right. But, mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You're listening to Writer's Voices, and our guests today are Fern Johnson and Marlene Fine, author of Let's Talk Race, A Guide for White People. Now, you talked about, you know, why you, why you decided to write this book. There have been um, a number of books about race that have gotten a lot of attention lately, and one of them is also by a white person and for white people, and that's White Fragility. And it's gotten a lot of sort of pushback um, about, you know, whether or not she should, as a white woman, be speaking on this subject. Do you, have you experienced some of that same pushback? Uh, Yes, actually we have um, in some interesting ways. Uh, So uh, first, when, um, when we were sending our proposal out, um, and um, I know that you're aware of this uh, from, I assume, many of the authors that you've talked with. It's very hard to actually get a publisher to take a look at a proposal unless you have an agent, and we did not. Um, and so, you know, uh, we spent a lot of time trying to find publishers that would even entertain looking at our manuscript. And then when we found the publisher who um, eventually published us, New Society Publishers, uh, the editor who had received the uh, proposal wrote back and said, you know, he was very, very interested, um, wanted some more material, and he was going to pass it by the editorial board. And the first response from the editorial board was, nobody wants to read a book by white people. So what's the point of doing this? Um, and so, you know, we had to provide more material, and, and we were lucky enough to have an editor who really believed in the book. And so the book got published. Uh, but then we had the experience um, before the actual publication, but when it was in digital format and um, sent out to the Edelweiss group um, and there was a presentation, again, booksellers responded by saying, you know, why the interest in um, a book by white people? Nobody wants to read that. Um, and so, you know, there, there has been uh, some pushback about that. Uh, We were heartened by the response from African-American reviewers of the book uh, who felt that it was a very important book and that it was time for white people to stand up and take responsibility. Uh, And in fact, that's part of what motivated our writing the book. Uh, We had seen how difficult it was, it is, uh, for white people to talk about race. That had been our experience in the classroom, in workshops, uh, in dialogues. But at the same time, we had heard our black friends and colleagues say they were so tired of white people not engaging with them about race, and they were tired of teaching us about race. Uh, so we really thought it was time to stand up and take responsibility. And we were hopeful that not just our educational and professional background, but the ways in which we had come to understand issues of race because of our experience as the white parents of black children, that we had something to offer to white people 
we're not talking to people of color, but to white people that might help them get past their own concerns, fears, reluctance about talking about race. Well, let's go like to the content of the book and the way that you've structured it. You have some very specific, um, you know, each chapter has a specific goal. So do you want to kind of walk, talk us through that? Sure. Um, so the, the entire book is structured so that in each chapter we are providing, you know, a content base, whatever the focus of the chapter, chapter is. I'll say a little about that in, in a second. And then also in that chapter offering uh, some prompts, some for personal reflection, things for people to think about themselves, you know, personally, privately, to try to explore their racial thinking. And then to the point of the book, conversational prompts. So some specific ways in which groups of people, whether they're ongoing groups or ones that are just being formed, uh, can actually focus on on race and, and and deal with some topics that would have different viewpoints expressed, and so that that's integrated into the chapters. So we start with some chapters in which we talk about the importance of conversation. That conversation is the way we build relationships, hear people's stories, develop trust, and most importantly empathy that you know until we really can hear other people's stories it's very difficult to develop empathy so we have you know a chapter that deals with that we have a chapter that deals with types of racism we have one that deals with um uh you know white white privilege and the ways in which we normalize whiteness and you know how to get to a point of being able to think about that you know, Marlene and I learned so much about that in the process of being the white parents of black children, um, things that we hadn't seen. Um, we have a chapter uh, that covers, um, we call it Raising Your Racial IQ, so how to get smarter, learn more about race. Uh, we start with a, with a historical context to provide some really important basic information that helps people understand how what happened during enslavement still has an impact today. You know, it has an in impact in, you know, education. You know, we have, we have segregated schools today, you know, in Boston, which is our area now. Um, Boston has worse segregation in its schools than it did back in the historic Boston busing, you know, when they were trying to solve this problem. Uh, healthcare disparities, we've learned some about those during the coronavirus. But, you know, there are there are so many of them, you know, um, uh, health, you know, health disparities, wealth disparities. We also talk about criminal justice. And again, we've gotten a glimpse of that after George Floyd was murdered. Um, so then we talk about some cultural um, practices among some African Americans that whites don't understand. And finally, we offer some guidelines for how to find conversational partners, talk about race. Um, so that's really the sweep of the book. Why should someone who is... Um lives in a white community, is mostly around white people, really isn't interacting with people of other races, why should they care? Why should they read your book? Uh, the racial divide in this country is so huge. Um, and it's not getting better. It's getting worse. Uh, recent research, um, you know, just from the last several months, uh, suggests that the way in which whites and blacks experience the world is hugely different, and that difference seems to get bigger by the year. Um, we have got to overcome that divide. We have got to heal that divide if we are going to move forward as a country. Uh, we need to find some way to move toward racial justice and equity, and that is only going to happen 
when we get to know each other, know each other as people. And that means first that whites need to better understand how they think about race or how we think about race and to talk with each other and then to find ways to talk across race. And it's, it is more difficult when you live in a white community uh, to find people to talk with. And so, you know, we have to be active in reaching out and finding people to talk with. But we have to learn to understand each other as people, and we have to develop empathy for others, because the only way we'll ever develop the kind of trust that allows us to create relationships to move toward racial justice and equity is by really talking to each other. I would just add one other point quickly. Um, you know, there there are some white people who are just closed and they're going to, you know, stay closed to, to this. And so just bracketing that for a minute, um, you know, as you certainly know, you know, the the population of this country is vastly changing. And that is not going to stop. Um, so, I mean, there really is an imperative for moving out of kind of a mental cultural space that is c- conducted by however white people have conducted it, you know, whatever we're talking about, you know, it's institutions, you know, in our society or neighborhood relations or what have you, because this this is... This is changing. Young people, by and large, understand this um, because they're learning more and there's more, you know, we'll call it intermarriage, but, but you know, marriage and, and coupling across, you know, race and ethnicity. Um, so these changes are happening, and it's not a train that's going to slow down. You're listening to Writer's Voices, and our guests today are Fern Johnson and Marlene Fine, authors of Let's Talk Race, A Guide for White People. Why don't you read a little bit from the book for us? Sure. Um, we have we have two passages. Uh, the first one is really about what we're trying to accomplish in the book, and Marlene is going to start with that one. Great. We believe that talking about race is imperative, but requires commitment to listen, willingness to entertain new ideas, and openness to learning that one's thinking about many aspects of race has been wrong, often harmfully wrong. If we do not talk about race, then our ideas remain private and passively influenced by media images and what we might read about race. If we do not talk about race for fear of saying the wrong thing, then the unsaid is allowed to speak for itself. Yet before we can engage productively with one another, we need to examine why whites find it so hard to talk about race. Racial barriers stand firm. We need to learn why those barriers exist and how we can diminish them to achieve racial justice and equity. We need to ask and answer, why do we continue to exist in racial boxes which set up boundaries and barriers that persist today? If I as a white person fear that I will say the wrong thing, how does that create a barrier? If I as a white person know little about the distribution of wealth among races in our country, how does that create a barrier? If I as a white person say that I do not see color, how does that create a barrier? Barriers in these examples are created by fear in the first case, ignorance in the second, and lack of empathy in the third. The worst culprit is likely the physical barriers of separation in neighborhoods. We cannot know and understand other people if we do not have contact with them. The housing barrier creates divisions in education, occupation, lifestyle, and health. The United States continues to be residentially segregated, even though there has been slight progress in recent years. Federal, state, and local policies created a suburban-urban split, with people of color concentrated in urban areas. Large metropolitan areas in the North and Midwest, such as Milwaukee, New York, Chicago, Detroit, Cleveland, Buffalo, have the highest levels of segregation. Within those areas, neighborhood boundaries function like signposts to show who lives where. Rural America, which accounts for slightly less than one-fifth of the U.S. population, is close to 80% white. 
We'll discuss this topic more in Chapter 4, but for now we want to stress that the barriers between races will not be brought down until and unless we acknowledge them, learn about them, discuss their existence, and willingly do something to diminish them. Our book calls on white people to talk with one another and with people of color about race and to explore why whites have such a difficult time in conversations about race. If we can't talk among ourselves, how will we ever be able to talk constructively across racial boundaries? We as white people need to talk frankly, respectfully, and without defensiveness. We view talk among white people as essential to gaining the courage and skill to talk across the racial divide. And we view talk across race as essential to building the trust, understanding, and relationships essential to achieving racial equity. The second passage we'd like to read uh, is one that addresses issues of uh, white normalcy and white privilege. And I'm going to start on that one. Uh, I'm going to recount uh, actually a, a passage here from the book which is starts with an experience that Marlene had. This is Fern uh, reading. A black participant in, pr- participant in a race dialogue that Marlene was facilitating shared a long story about taking a family member to the hospital the previous weekend. He said that the family waited a long time for assistance, and when the ill person was finally seen by the doctor, the other family members were taken to a waiting area and left without any follow-up information for many hours. He attributed their treatment by the medical staff to the fact that the family was black. When the man finished telling his story, a white woman in the group quickly raised her hand and said that she was a nurse and could absolutely assure him that anyone would have been treated in the same way at that hospital and that race was not the reason. The black man listened patiently and then quietly said, You are denying my experience. You don't have any way of knowing how I and my family are treated in public places. The issue was not whether race was the cause of the treatment. The issue is the white woman's refusal to consider a black man's experience might be racially based and therefore different from hers. As a nurse, the white woman may have felt that she needed to defend people in the medical profession as not racist. Again, however, her defense simply denies the black man's experience. As college professors who taught many courses that introduced students to the concept of white privilege, we assumed we were savvy about what white privilege means in real life. It was only after after we adopted a black child that we came to see our privilege. When we were out with our son, people, white and black, would come up to us and almost tearfully tell us what wonderful people we were and how blessed our son was because we had adopted him. Would they have said the same if it were two black women and a white baby? We doubted it. Many years later, a black friend recounted how when she was out with her light-skinned child, she was mistaken for his nanny. White privilege is a form of internalized white supremacy. We deny that we have a race, At the same time, we tacitly see our race as superior. We recognize that white supremacy is a term that is fraught for many whites and often leads to defensiveness and even anger. It is also, however, a term that captures what it means when a person or group sees and or benefits from their way of living in the world because it's normalcy and by implication, it's being better than other ways of living in the world. The Cambridge Dictionary defines supremacy as the leading or controlling position, position of being the best and the highest authority or greatest power. As such, the word accurately describes how we normalize and privilege whiteness. The dangers of white privilege are many, but perhaps the most serious one is how it prevents whites from being able to understand the daily burdens that blacks carry with them. Many years ago, when our children were very young, we stopped to look at a beach house for rent on Cape Cod. The white owner assured us that the house was available. We told her that we had a few other houses to look at, and we would call her early the next morning to let her know if we wanted the house. When we called, 
she said that the house was no longer available. Hearing that, we were convinced that she would not rent to us because our children were black. The owner proved us wrong a few hours later when she called back to say that she had convinced the people who had rented the house to change their rental dates because she thought our boys were adorable and would love staying in the house. The damage was done, however, because the moment we heard that the house was no longer available to rent, we understood the horror of believing that everything that happens to you might be because of your skin color. We also understood how that belief would constantly haunt us and would sometimes even distort our understanding of events in our lives and our children's lives. Why didn't he get a solo in the band concert? Why was he left out of the team photograph? We even questioned the good things that happened, thinking that the boys sometimes received good grades or accolades simply because they were black, and other people either had low expectations for them or were afraid to judge them fairly for fear of being called racist. We weren't always right about why things happened, but often we were. That meant we had to be constant vigilant that's uh, the end of that passage thank you yeah. I'm guessing um, from the dates that you spoke about earlier that your sons are now adults is that am I accurate uh, yes uh, they're 32 and 30 now okay yeah. what do they think of your book <laughs> um, uh, they are very proud of us <laughs> Um, and um, I, I hope from your laughter you can relate to our sending chapters and they're saying, oh, yeah, I'll get to it, Mom. Don't worry, I'll get to it. <laughs> next, next weekend, next weekend. <laughs> but they know, they, they know what the book is about and what we address, and, and you know, they, they've heard us talk about it so often. Um, it's often, you know, yeah, Mom, we get it, you know. Yeah, <laughs> right, yeah. they're eye roll. <laughs> but we really, we feel very gratified that, that they're proud of us and that they tell other people about the book, and, which they also did about the interracial adoption book. So, um, and, and they're okay, okay with being the subject matter to some extent, you know, to having anecdotes yeah. from their lives. Yes. Yeah. We've, you know, we've asked them very explicitly about that, both for the, the, the book that we wrote on interracial adoption and for this one. And before we um, did our book launch, for this book, um, we, we talked to both of them and we said, look, you know, there are people who are going to, to maybe like look into your lives, track, try to track you down, you know, just so we just want to make sure. And they both said, fine, you know, I don't think that's happened so far. Um, but I mean, there, everybody knows, you know, from reading the book, we dedicate the book to them and we mention them in the book. So it's, it's not a mystery and, and, and they're fully, fully aware of that. We right, actually have right. a very funny story about that when we wrote the interracial adoption option. Um, um, when that book was launched, uh, we did a couple of blog posts for Huffington Post. And, um, when we did our first one, HuffPost asked us for a picture of the family, and um, we were very careful to, you know, protect the boys, and so we said we wouldn't put a picture in, and we were telling the boys that we had told Huffington Post we wouldn't do a picture, and they looked at us and said, well, why not? We'd like to have our picture out there. Oh, uh, <laughs> how old were they then? Yeah, they also said, well, um, the pictures are all over Facebook anyway. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah right, they, were in, right. they were in college then. So. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit more about this concept of white privilege, because you mentioned, Marlene, that you didn't really understand your white privilege because of um, having experienced some discrimination. And I think a lot of white people who are not, you know, the elite, um, mm -hmm. you know, didn't grow up wealthy and you know, waspy, I guess, may, may have similar, um, a similar point of view and kind of resent the idea that they have privilege. So, how do you how do you break through that resistance to the concept? Well, one of the things that we focus on is talking about ourselves and coming, um, you know, to learn about our privilege 
So, you know, I'll go back to, to my background. Um, I grew up, my um, father and mother didn't have much money. Uh, my father always worked three jobs uh, when I was a kid. I virtually never saw him. He worked um, five days a week. He worked nights. He worked weekends um, to earn enough money. Um, and as I said, I experienced anti-Semitism um, as uh, as a kid. Uh, I experienced anti-Semitism in high school because in, in those days, the best job that a high school girl could have was working for AT&T, and they didn't hire Jews. Um, but when we were writing the book and going back and, and sort of thinking about issues, I became aware that, you know, my parents bought a very small house when I was a child, and they were able to do that because my dad got a loan from the government on the GI Bill. Uh, that wasn't open to blacks. I um, went on uh, to school and was always, you know, uh, given uh, high praise uh, because I was very smart. I go off to college. I'm the first in my family to go to college. I go to a public university, and um, I had all of these mentors who took me under their wing, um, told me that I was smart, told me I could go to graduate school. Uh, when I said I didn't have the money to do that, told me that they were sure I could get funding for graduate education. These were not things that I knew about. Um, I had professors who'd invite me to their homes and taught me about, you know, proper silverware and, you know, foods that I'd never been um, uh, exposed to. And so I began to realize that because I was white, I was seen in a particular way, and people didn't undervalue the contributions that I made. They didn't assume that I couldn't be smart. They were willing to mentor me. And these are not opportunities that, you know, young women of color would have been given. And um, and so, you know, I, I began to understand the kind of privileges I had as a white woman. And then, of course, once we had black children, we saw it happen. We saw these things in operation. I found the this... Um exercise that you talk about in the book really interesting the challenge walk uh, or the op the opportunity the opportuni walk the opportunity walk yes can yeah. you describe that yeah i mean it's 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 an it's an amazing um visual demonstration of white privilege so it, it's obviously something that would be done with a, a, a group of people where they all start and standing you know in, in a in a row not 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 front and back, but side by side in a row, and then they're asked questions, and depending on the answer to the question, they take a step forward or they take a step backward. So, for example, you might ask a question such as, "Are you uh, the first generation college student in your family?" You know, step forward or step backward, or or might you might be asked if you grew up in a home with two parents. Uh, you might be asked if you took an airplane flight before you were an adult. Um, you, you could be asked if you um, were ever uh, the subject of racial slurs or other kinds of ethnic slurs when you were in school. So then, you know, the, eventually the exercise ends, and, you know, so everybody is told to stay in place. And invariably, um, um, referring now to a group where they have some, some mixture of race and ethnicities, invariably the group at the front or those at the, more at the front are white and the people at the back are, are black. And then the middle will have some mixture. And then you ask the people in the front to turn around and look mm. <laughs> who's behind them. <laughs> And, you know, this is, it's a, it can be a wrenching emotional experience because the people in the, in the back know why they're in the back. I mean, it's not news to them why they're in the back. A lot of the people in the front don't, don't realize that until they think about the questions, you know, talk about the exercise and understand what it means specifically in terms of all kinds of things that happen in their lives that give them a kind of privilege, even if they're not wealthy, 
um, that is not the case for most most black people. Now, one thing I've noticed, you know, as the con the conversation about race has certainly increased over the past year because of the um, George Floyd and the other killings and the attention in Black Lives Matter and so forth, and that's a good thing. But I have noticed sometimes that it feels like whatever a white person tries to contribute to the conversation is um, is criticized by somebody. That sometimes people are trying to be allies, they don't know how, they stick their foot in their mouth, and they get shot down, and then, and then maybe they're not going to try anymore. Mm-hmm. Yes. I... I... I think you, you know, your observation is, is accurate in terms of the current climate. Uh, Fern and I have actually talked a lot about this. My perception is that often uh, white people get shot down by other white people um, and that black people are much more open uh, to accepting that a white person is trying. Uh, sometimes the issue is that we are uh, defensive um, or thin-skinned, you know, I think we always want our contributions to be, you know, valued in some really great way, you know, that we want to be thanked for being an ally, <laughs> you know, and, and if we're or not acknowledged, at least. <laughs> or acknowledged in some way, and, you know, I think we have to get over that um, and understand that, you know, it, it's our responsibility to be part of this conversation. Um, and that uh, we need to be out there. And sometimes it's going to hurt, and sometimes it's going to make us sad, and sometimes it's going to make us guilty, sometimes it's going to make us angry, uh, but we need to stick with it um, and stay with it. Uh, but I, I, I think you're right. There is a kind of um, a sense that some people are saying, you know, we don't want to hear from white people. We just want you to stand there. Um, and, it, it, you know, I think it is important at times for us to stand there and, and be allies, but we also need to be talking and we need to be out there having conversations. But as I said, I think often it's other white people who are shutting shutting down mm -hmm. white people. Well, yours is the third book that I've read um, on this topic. So I read White Fragility and I read How to Be an Anti-Racist. Oh, uh, yes. Yeah. 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 Which was which was great, and but I will admit on on white fragility as I'm reading it, I'm I'm feeling like there's no way I can ever be right, <laughs> um, <laughs> and and I did not get that feeling from your book. I your book was much more here, you know, here's what you need to know, and here's how to here's how to move forward, not just here's what's wrong. Mm -hmm. um, well, yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. the basic purpose of our book is is to be used, you know, to be used productively to help people listen, figure out how to talk without being defensive, without changing the subject, uh, to learn more. So we're really trying to, to offer a constructive pathway to better conversation, developing trust, relationship, empathy, uh, so that we can actually get somewhere without people just clutching up and freezing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we just really want to offer encouragement to people. Um, it, it, we really do understand that there are a variety of reasons why it is so difficult for whites to talk about race. Um, not the least of which is that, you know, we don't see ourselves as having race. And so, you know, the, People who we then see as having a race become the other. You know, they're, they're the ones who are different in some way. And so the, the coming to terms and the recognizing that we've simply normalized whiteness as the way of being and that we need to learn to recognize other ways of being in the world and appreciate those, value them, um, that, you know, if, if people can begin to do that, then we can open up conversations. We don't have a whole lot of time left, and I did want to talk to you a little bit about the writing process on this, because and your other book that you co-wrote. 
So you're a, a couple, you're living together, you're writing together. What are the challenges of that? Well, our challenges were primarily that neither of us really can understand the way the other person goes about the process of writing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, we've known this. We, we, we've known that we had very different ways of writing because, you know, we've been together for a long time, but we weren't writing books together. Um, so yeah, I write by having a general idea of what I'm going to write about. And then I sit down and I write and I meander around and, you know, I get rid of it and then I add something and then I restructure it and I go around and around. But, you know, I kind of know where I want to end up. Now, Marlene's process of writing, she can describe her process of writing. So um, I'm trained as a debater. I was an intercollegiate debater. And um, my process is to outline everything to death. You know, I have to know what I'm going to be writing before I actually sit down and write. And so I spend a lot of time working through ideas, outlining ideas. And um, I've, I've done a lot of uh, co-writing through my academic career, so I've often had co-authors, and we would spend hours doing this, and Fern would listen and be absolutely, you know, dumbstruck. Horrified. Like, how can you do this? <laughs> you know, just sit down and write. <laughs> so uh, we had to work through that. So well, we had to work through that. how <laughs> did you do that? Well, you know, we, for both of the books, we... Uh, made a division in terms of who was going to do the first draft of each chapter. And then we would make, uh, I would say Marlene was patient with me in this regard, <laughs> you know, it, main topics that were going to be covered in the chapter. But I, I was not interested in, nor could I work with a, you know, a very detailed outline. So then each of us would write a our, our drafts, our first drafts, and then the other, we would trade them, and then the other person would go through and, and work with them. Um, so that, that seemed to work, um, for us. And we would do, uh, numerous iterations. So Fern would draft a chapter, I would edit it, she would take it back, redo it, um, I would edit again, and, you know, our goal was always to try um, by the end of the process, to not really be able to identify different voices, but to to be writing as a single voice. I think you accomplished that. You know, I, I can't. <laughs> you. I you. can't see. You know, I can't tell which one of you <laughs> was which in the book. So yeah, and um, so you had the you had the contract before you actually wrote the book. Yeah, yes. we we yeah. we pretty much, I would say, had given them the whole first chapter, part of two other chapters, you know, and this was during this process of some reservations on some of the editorial board members about two women writing this book about race. Right. So they asked for very specific things, and then we would write some stuff, you know, mm -hmm. for them. Um. So that had happened, but the book was, as is always the case for a proposal, the chapters were laid out and, mm -hmm. and they knew you know, generally what we were going to be covering. Did and you... um, the other thing that we had to be very careful of is that, you know, we are academics, we had long academic careers, um, and so we were used to academic um, writing. And, um, you know, so the process of learning to write in a way that was accessible to a more general audience um, was also a real challenge for us. Was that more difficult for one of you than the other? Or was it? Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. yeah. This is Fern. This is Fern speaking, and I tend to write very convoluted, syntactically <laughs> complex sentences, some of which I could get away with in my academic writing. Um, and you know, Marlene is a little more fluid in her <laughs> in her writing. But we also, you know, had a, a friend who's uh, a retired um, uh, radio journalist, and she read she read over everything we wrote, not not for content at all. And you know, we were often shocked when she would make a flag somewhere for a word, and she'd say, 
nobody knows what this word means. <laughs> <laughs> or, or just divide this into three sentences, please. <laughs> So, well, it it know. does it does read very smoothly. So I oh, I think you. I think thank between you. the between the three of you, you got the job done. <laughs> thank you. Well, I want to thank you for being with us today, and um, we always close with a quote, and I found one that I think is very apt for this book, and it's from James Baldwin: "Not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced." Yeah. Ah, excellent. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And see you all next week on Writer's Voices. Thanks. Thanks for inviting. Thank you. This is delightful.